Welcome to Pete's podcast. Very first new series, and this is with starting at number one with a former United number one, number one and great, with Gary Bailey. Hello, Gary. Hey, Pete. Great to be here, especially on your number one, your very first podcast. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, we just said before, we're up at the Cloud in Manchester, the Hilton Hotel, and it's changed a bit since you first uh, moved to Manchester back in 1978, was it? Yeah, we were just saying, it was actually December 77 I arrived, and uh, arrived in December, so it was cold, it was wet, it was miserable. <laughs> it was quite a snowy, snowy Christmas, it was, that year, it was wasn't it? It was a very yeah. cold one, yeah. And, um, but I think Manchester back in those days was a much more industrial town. Today it's, uh, I mean, I was actually driving in, and the, the, the cabbie was telling me about all the buildings that are going up and the people moving into the area. And it's, it's, it's amazing to see how this, this city has become a real top-class European city in the last 30 years. I think it's down to one person and one person only. So Alex. Yeah, I think he's definitely... He's, does, he's made it happen because, you know, United and the success of United has put Manchester on the map big time. Not that it wasn't before, but in a really, really big way. Um, yeah, of course, City, City doing well and having lots of money also helps. But I think United's made made this town the town it is. And when you came over, like I mean, uh, in some ways, you think about uh, like Marcus Rashford getting his chance in the modern day, really by a stroke of luck in terms of the injury in, pre, in, in the European game when he was just a substitute, and then he took his chance. I mean, a bit similar to, if I recall, Alex Stepney was on his way out in terms of playing. And United tried to sign Jim Bly from Coventry, didn't they? That's right. And Jim yeah. Bly failed the medical, agreed terms, failed the medical, and then yeah. uh, you were thrust in and saved Martin Edwards a bit of money, didn't you? I did, I did. But yeah, I didn't see any of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was one of those. They just said, go out and play and have some fun. And um, I don't think anyone expected me at, at 20 years of age to stay in the team. But we, we seemed to do quite well. We went on to the cup final that year, which obviously we lost, which was a bit sad, but it was a harsh reality for me. And the following year we finished second in the league, um, had a really, really, probably my best season at United. Everything went right, I was loving it, enjoying it. Um, we, we had a chance to the final, which is the final we gave at Leeds, yeah. didn't we? Yeah, we did, yeah, we went to Leeds knowing that if Liverpool lost and we won, we'd be champions. Um, not that we played scintillating football that year, we weren't known as, as, as an exciting team, but it was a solid team, defensively very sound, and um, so that first year was brilliant. And then the years after that, we just seemed to keep coming close and not quite pulling it off. And frustrating years for I think everybody involved with the club. Did you, did you really think in this? Because I remember being really excited. I actually made a comparison recently. I said that uh, I've not probably been this excited with the pre-season signings. Yes. I have been when we signed Jesper yes. Olsen. Mm. Uh, Gordon Strachan and even Alan Brazil. I mean, he hadn't really set the world alight at, uh, at Tottenham. It was still a, he had a good, such a good time at Ipswich. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, in that and, and that season, obviously, after being cup winners in '83, we signed him in the summer, and that was a bit of a disappointing season. We went out of the cup to Bournemouth, but the year after, when we won the cup, and we, we, you know, we, we, we think we possibly came third in the end, didn't we, to Everton that season? Yeah. But, we, but we had a chance of the league. And I always think whether if we'd not done that great cup run, would we be able to do the FA Cup? Yeah. You know, do we do the league? I mean, did you did you think did you think the season after we won at Wembley with White Side going? Do you think when we had the ten match run, did you honestly think that was going to be our time? Yeah, very much so. I thought that was our time. I thought every season before that was as well. To be fair, from the moment Ron arrived, we were in with a shout. Uh, we finished third, fourth, second, third. Um, we just needed a little bit of luck because on the season we played well, Everton were brilliant. Um, we needed to have a season where maybe Robbo wasn't injured and we weren't playing in three or four cups. Um, it just needed something to go right. And I look back at that spell and think that team was as good, or well, it was good enough to be champions, and should and fans should be looking back and saying, hey, the team of 84, 5, 6 should go down as one of the legendary United teams. And it won't because we didn't win the league. I, I, I know what you're saying about that, and the league is the, is the real for United fans. It is the test. It is the real sort of the, the mark, the benchmark. But you'd be surprised how many people from my generation do actually think that the football under Big Ron was some of the, was, was some of the best ever they've seen. Yeah. They still do. They very very fondly remember that team. Yeah. Well, I understand what you mean about the league, and I mean it's not good for you. But I mean at least Ro, at least Robbo got his couple of titles yeah. that he, he really deserved. But I used to think at the time, Gary, that as good as the team was, what we needed 
was a Lineker or a Rush. I didn't like it. You know, we needed mm. we needed because because as yeah. good as, as good as Norman was, obviously, and 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 and, and Mark Hughes yeah. and Frank. They, they were never really on the regular. We, we, we didn't really have the 20 goals. Pace. The yeah, pace yeah, yeah we, we didn't have the 20 yeah. goals. Strike, you know what I mean? They'd score spectacular goals, wouldn't they? Yeah. Would you like another latte? Hey. No, no, I'm fine for the moment. Yeah, I'm all right. No, no, good. Is this all on the podcast? I'm cut this yeah, out. Well, I'll have to laugh. <laughs> Keep it on. Well, yeah. See, see I was Look. offering to buy Gary a drink there. Yeah, it was yeah. a latte. Half price. A, yeah. Half price. Um, yeah, look, if we had a Gary Lineker or one of those players, absolutely, we, we could have won it even without that. We were, you know, just needed the right, the right, um, the right season. Defensively, we were sound. I think we we had the best, you know, uh, clean sheets record or goals against record in at least, you know, four of those six seasons. So it wasn't like we were conceding too many goals. But you're right, we just didn't have. Didn't there? there were some games that we just couldn't create a goal from nothing, and that's what Lineker was able to do with Everton. And it was a strong rumour he was going to come to United when he went to Everton, wasn't he? Yeah. The, the, the newspapers at the time said United are clear favourites with Liverpool second. Bloody next day he signs for Everton. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, going back into those days, you almost wish, and I mean, Ron was good, Ron was good with buying players, so you could never criticise him for that, but you almost wish you could go back and say to Ron, there are certain players you have to get, and even if yeah. we have to mortgage the blooming training ground, go and get Gary Lineker, go and get this one, go and get that one, and we'll win leagues and we'll win Europe. And we were that close and we had that many good players, and I think that was the frustration of my era, is that when I eventually retired in 87, um, that it was it was nearly, we nearly did this and we nearly did that, and, yeah. and people will always look back and say, why didn't we? And then you become part of a discussion. You know, well, maybe we should have had a striker. Maybe we should have been better in defence. You know, and and that's frustrating to end a career that could have that could have won so many trophies for United, um, with always the questions of if, but, maybe. You know, what? What? How? How did it? Yeah. How did it? Maybe I'm going. How did it differ? You spoke about this football under Dave Sexton. He's obviously been linked a lot with uh, last two managers we've had before, Jose Mourinho. You know, some of the some people. Looking back to the not too fun periods under under Dave Sexton when they thought the football was pretty dire, mm. Mm. Uh, well, how did he and his approach everything differ from Ron Atkinson? Because it was almost like they went from flamboyant to Tommy mm. Doherty yeah. to a serious man in Sexton, and they went back towards that with Big Ron and yeah. a bit back towards more that yeah. and the entertainer, wasn't it? He was. He was a great entertainer, Ron. I still, I think he deserved to win the title as much. I think it's you know we've we've chatted as I have with all the players and we all agree that Ron and that team was good enough and, and we should have done something. D- Dave was a bit like Van Gaal I guess, he was you know, very clever. Very respected you, as a coach very, wasn't he? Very, as, as Van Gaal was. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's just, it might have worked with some teams, with the players he had, it, it just got too, it got too it got too defensive minded, you know, if, if defensively we weren't 100% we weren't going to win games because we had no attack, everything was, I was like, no attack, but we were yeah. very focused on um, on defensive and midfield. Um, and if then if you have a if you have a Gary Lineker, yes, you know you can win. But we had big big job front. And if you don't give, if you don't give Joe service, he's not, he's going to battle to score for you. He's not a he hasn't got speed, he hasn't got the skill, but he's as brave as the, probably the bravest I've ever met. Um, but you've got to give him service. So uh, under Dave, there was the potential for the football to be boring and to go wrong, which in the end it did. I mean, yeah. to be fair, we, we, we could have won the, the league in, in 80. Although, although in his last season, we we won the last seven league yeah. games. And we, we, yeah. I remember, because we, we drew, I always remember, we, we drew against Villa, who went on to win the league, obviously. We drew three all at Villa Park. And the following, if you remember the following week, we, in, in midweek, we played we played uh, Notts Forest. And Kenny Burns scored a fantastic home goal into the Stratford end, and it was one all. I, was, I should have got out more. I don't know. Yeah. And then we won the seven games on the run. Yeah. And I just think, you know, but you know, but that, that was only papering over the cracks, really. When it was still, a, you know, it was an underachieving season. It wasn't building on what we'd done yeah. the, the season before. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I, I've often wondered if Alex had come earlier whether he would have done more, um, because Ron was brilliant in many ways, but he wasn't big on tactics. But he's just a lovely person, great, you know, larger than life character. Um, and Dave Sexton was all about tactics but didn't have the motivation. So Alex had both and I just wonder if he'd have come a season or two earlier whether that team of 85 would have gone on to have won do, do you wish that because also because you know you, you would have loved to have like, been a part of his plans and obviously you know yeah. but, but, you know, being honest you, were, you was at the tail end of your career obviously weren't you? You, you? you could almost probably see what Alex Stepney might have been going through when you came on the scene as well really, couldn't yeah. you? Yeah. Well I was still young, I mean I retired at 27, 28 through injury so um, 
I could have gone on for another, you know, five in goalkeeper to go on long yeah, uh, coast. Yeah, and it would have been awesome to have played for him. But um, you had suffered with injuries a lot towards the end, don't you? You do. I think once once you pick up one bad injury, then it, it tends to you tend to sort of pick up other injuries. You know, you, you're carrying your knee, then you, you get a hamstring problem and all that. But yeah, look, the ifs and buts and maybes. I, you know, I'm just happy for the, the lads that follow that they had the incredible time and for the fans. And, and I, I was saying, for, I've been saying for years, what happens when Fergie goes and we stop winning? Because for for a generation of fans, they won't know what to do with themselves, and that's yeah. what's happened the last three years. I think those fans have gone, what the hell? We used to win in the league every year. What, you know, what's this finishing seventh or or fifth or out of Europe? Well, when we when we, I honestly thought after what happened in eighty five, eighty six, when not only did we not win the league, when Liverpool ended up doing the double, and then in ninety two, when we lost the league to Leeds. Mm. And honestly, Gary, I thought we would never win the league. Right? I just thought it was jinxed. And, and when we won one league, I was chatting to Fergie before I got to sort of know it. I was chatting to Fergie outside Old Trafford and I shook his hand. It was like a, a Canton had been turned off two games on the run. And we, it, it was the year, the year we won the first double in 94. That's, and all the press was saying United are going to fall away and all that. And I just said to him, look, Alex, if we ever win anything else, I just wanted that one title. Thank you. Obviously, it doesn't mean you know. And yeah. I was remembering just looking yeah. at it that way, right? And, and it didn't mean I didn't want us to win anything. Sure, sure, but sure. I just thought that you know, winning the league was just such a thing. And that's, I know people want to call the European Cup the Holy Grail, and it's great to win the European Cup. But if you, even now, if you gave me a choice, I would go for the league. Yeah, yeah. No, the league is much more difficult to win, especially in England. I mean, I, I, I work in the US and we follow the, the Spanish football, so. I'm watching uh, Barca and Real Madrid every week. Now, it's it's a three-horse race here with Atletico Madrid. Uh, the others haven't really got a chance. In England, it's, it's six, seven, as we saw with Leicester last year, can be yeah. more than, than the top seven. Um, it was quite um, amazing, that one tip, really. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it could never happen. I don't know how it happened, and I can't ever see it ever even coming close. If to they wouldn't have the won it, like, look at the season. If they wouldn't have won it, we, you know, they, they wouldn't have had another chance like that, would yeah. they? But see, that's, that's the whole thing about us in the eighties. Is we just needed a little bit of luck. I mean, not like Leicester's level of luck, but uh, we just needed a season. I, I'll give you an example. Villa in eighty-two won the league. Yeah. And they played fifty. I think it was something like fifteen players all season. Yeah. Something like Tony that. Morley I mean, in it. Tony Morley, yeah, Gary yeah. Shaw, Peter Wood yeah. up front. They kept the same guys week in and week out. If they'd have had a couple of injuries, they would never have won it. Because yeah. they had nothing, they had no depth. Um, we had every season, we sold Sparky to Barcelona one season, we had Robert out for another season. We just it, what, There wasn't one season where it was plain sailing, there was always problems and there was cups. Um, and we got the League Cup final and the FA Cup final yeah. in 83, we got to the uh, European uh, Cup Winners Cup semi-final in 84. Um, it's just one of those things. We had a Leicester year where it was all focused just mm. on the league, and you didn't get any injuries. I think we'd have walked away with a couple of league titles. But again, what could have been, what should have been, it's all water under the bridge. And as long as the fans have good memories of of those days, and uh, like you say, you can I, I, think I, I, of. Things. I, I, I think yeah, I understand what you're saying. Stuff, but I think you you're really underestimating how fondly that team is. Yeah, people are frustrated about some things, but some of the, you know people have gone as far as say some of the some of the. Attacking football for those couple of couple of those years, in particular, yeah. was up there with anything. Fergie's teams have actually pl- attractive-wise. I'm not okay. They yeah. achieve more. Yeah. But thinking, so tell me about America, because you you, were, I know you've recently moved to America. Is it in the last couple of years? But you you were in South Africa for a big time, doing yeah. doing doing as a as a presenter or a, what you've been doing in in TV. In work. TV, yeah, yeah. Uh, when when I left here at uh, at 20, 27, I went back to South Africa and I was allowed to play part time because they were outside of FIFA. Right. That was the days before Mandela was released, so um, South Africa wasn't allowed to play soccer formally. And so I was allowed to play part-time there, because uh, I'd obviously retired here and wasn't allowed to play anywhere else. Um, and so I played two years, and actually I played for Kaiser Chiefs, one of the big yeah, local yeah. teams there, which was, I was only white guy on a black soccer team in South Africa in the apartheid years, which was a, which was a hell of an experience. I mean, um, Did you get criticised by, 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 by both sides? Yeah, or? well, certainly by the white side of it I did, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very brave to do in that period, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, and then also wherever I went, I had to be very careful that I wasn't seen as a government spy or something, get shot. Yeah, so, yeah. So. But you can't really win it, can you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it was good fun, and we won the league, so I eventually got my league title. Oh, I didn't excellent. work very, and the day after, we won the league my second season there my knee was killing me and I retired I thought that's it you've done you've ticked the box you've played for England you've been to a World Cup you've won FA Cups with United 10 years you know six trophies with Kaiser Chiefs including the league title which was always elusive here and I thought you know what if I play anymore my knee's going to be shot and to this day now I'm 58 I'm still 
running every day. It's so. amazing that you, you, yeah, I mean, because you realise because each player, you know, because Robbo's turning 60 and I think it's in January or something, you know, soon. And, you know, and these people, and you people are never like, you know, we, we're all getting, they were all to me. Well, I before I forget, my wife and her sister were only kids when you were playing, and, but you were, fa- you, you were, a, you were a favourite player basically because they thought you were called Gary Baldy. That's in the biscuit. <laughs> and they admit that right, you know what I mean? But I've got to say hey, I'm getting close these days <laughs> to Gary Baldy. <laughs> <laughs> they were talking about the biscuit guy. But this morning I was chatting to a guy in, in the airport where I work, just a passenger going through. He lives in, lives in Wales now, but he's from South Africa. So oh, that's why I'm meeting a friend today from South Africa, yeah. Gary Bailey. He admitted all his family were Chelsea because yeah. his dad used to play for che- yeah. with Alan Hudson as Chelsea schoolboys. All right, yeah. But he did say... I got Gary's autograph at, I think it was at M- Mabula Lodge. Oh, Mabula, yes. He goes, yes, in the yes. Late, he goes in the late 80s or early yeah, 90s. That's he right, said, he yeah. but he just he remembered that like, and he said, uh, he also his family, did he run some sports academy or something in the sports? He told me his mum's name, but I can't remember. Yeah. But it's some esteemed sports academy. I don't think it's just football, I think it's everything in, okay. South, in South Africa. But that was just a chance conversation today, yeah. that shows how small okay. the world it is. Yeah. But I want to move on to. Modern United now, and obviously we have we, we have been spoiled rotten with what Ferguson Just did. A bit, yeah. And does it not did it not also sum up? It's been covered on other topics, but the fact that to many fans after Moscow, the last three or four years, we didn't really build on the team. The team, you know, Ronaldo left. We didn't really mm. ex- make the team better. It, but it was because of Ferguson's man management that United could win the league and be challenging, go to European Cup finals with teams that probably weren't his best under, under, under yeah. his reign. Yeah. I mean. We're not going to see another manager stay no. that long, are we, at a top club? No, no, no. Uh, and to be fair, Fergie wouldn't have survived it uh, you know, currently because he wouldn't have been given four years to get going. Uh, it's a different world today. Um, but, I mean, he's the greatest of all time. It's just, I don't see anyone... Well, Mourinho maybe does compare to him. But, but certainly at United, you'll never get anything similar to that again. Um, and I, I just think, and I said it years ago, that fans will not appreciate what he's done for United until he goes. And now we've had good managers like Van Gaal. I mean, Van Gaal was a top, top class manager. Um, struggle, uh, because it's, it's just not easy. It takes time to produce teams, and Fergie was just a genius. Do you think that. it was like naive of him to, I agree with his, his coaching credentials, and even if it's truthful, when he said something like, we've got, our expectations are too high, and we've got to be looking, you know, both him and Moyes said comments like that, you know, in, it's what some fans would have understood if he said we've got a lot of rebuilding to do but it's how you sort of pop, you know he ba- mm-hmm. Van Gaal basically was credited with saying the fans expect too much of this club the expectations are too high yeah. now really being at Man United you know you, you, even even when we weren't winning the league we, we still expected you to come out and say we're going to win the league yeah, we sure, don't want sure. to hear you come out to start the season and say well we're happy to finish top five no, but, you, know, you don't want that do you no 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 100% no and it's something you can't accept at United either and again you know when I watch Barcelona and Real Madrid I'm looking at the two best teams in the league by far, way ahead of Man United at the moment, way, way ahead, which pees me off because uh, there was a time under Fergie when, when the gap was very small um, and they were outspending us, so that, that, was, that was understood. Now we're outspending them and they're still way, way better and that, that's got to be the barker for me and I'm sure that's what Mourinho, I'm, I'm sure he's got no question in his mind, he's looking at his old Real Madrid team um, and Barca and saying, guys, that's where I want us to be. And, and I think he will get us there. I'm a bit disappointed this last week with three losses back to back because, um, you know, I, th- I thought he would he would have figured it out more quickly. But it's given time. It's only been a you know a couple of months. But that to me is the yardstick for every United fan: is who's the best in the world. And you know, you cannot tell me we cannot compete with Bayern Munich and Real Madrid and Barcelona and Atletico Madrid and PSG, we have got to be in that conversation. Manchester City are in that conversation, which again pees me off even more, because they're, they're definitely in that conversation. They're a, good, they're a good team, they can go and win Europe fairly soon. Uh, we need to be there as well. And, and I will not accept, as a fan, I will not accept any, any, any manager who says otherwise. Thank you. Do you think that, looking at it hypothetically, do you think that Guardiola took the easier option Taking a, taking the job at City, where maybe he needed he needed tweaking a lot less than probably United did. Uh, you know, he's a proven manager in terms of he plays great football. The way he's, the way he's, you know the way he's, he's attracting to football. Is it is it fair to say that he's 
he's took over teams that are already like in a good shape and he's evolved them or, or has that been a bit too critical of him? It's difficult to say. I mean, the, the Barca side he took over had some of the best players in the world, including the likes of, of Messi and at the time Xavi and Iniesta. Um, at Bayern Munich he also took over a fantastic team and he's got a top top class squad at, at City but I think there's big pressure at City I think you know they, they expect to win big they've got the ambitions that Van Gaal doesn't have you know there's no way you're going to hear the City people saying well you know we're happy to finish top four they're not they, they want the league and they want European Champions League if anything um, so he's under pressure he's got to perform and he's under pressure on a long term basis because he hasn't won European Champions League with Bayern Munich and that was the big pressure in Germany. Yeah. Uh, so for him to be seen as the, as the top manager in the world, he has to go and win that with City. In the same way that Mourinho currently, for me, is the top manager in the world because he has won it with a number of clubs. But he, if he doesn't win it, he's in danger of slipping behind yeah. Pep in, in, a, in a real way. I mean, if, if, he, if he doesn't do much with United after what happened at Chelsea, uh, it's possible people will say, well, okay, he's done and dusted. And I don't believe that. I think Mourinho is just a, a genius of a manager. I, I think it was a good time to get him after what's happened mm. at Chelsea, because I think almost like a wounded animal, he wants to prove people even more wrong. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I've, I've, I've completely think, got, got belief in him. You know, even though he left under a cloud last season at Chelsea, I've got complete belief that he will, you know, he, he, will, he, will, he will transform it. I, I just want to see a bit more passion from him. The passion he's had over the years at Real Madrid and Inter, I mean, he was, he was a bit like Jurgen Klopp is now. Yeah. And I think fans love that, and, 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 and I think players love it. And just the last few weeks, I'm looking for it from Mourinho, and I haven't quite seen him with that same level of passion. Um, and this is the biggest club in the world. He's, he's got, you know, this, this, if this club doesn't make you passionate, United, then what is? So I don't know if it's him just being trying to be more mature, or him just settling in and Do you think it maybe, figuring it out. It could maybe be the fact that, like, he's probably aware that certain people higher up in the club, allegedly, didn't like some of his styles and, he, and his thinking. He's maybe trying to conform to a yeah. bit of, but I agree I'd rather see the fashion myself yeah. but maybe he's thinking he's trying to conform his own style with, with what's expected at United because yeah, it's what hidden it's you know it was one of the biggest hidden, hidden sort of like uh, worst secrets that he wanted the job for a while you know sure, sure. and I, I often can make the comparison that when uh, Tommy Doherty got sacked Laurie McMenemy was hoping he'd get off of the job and of course they gave it to Dave Sexton when Sexton got sacked apparently you know, he offered it to McMenemy first and he, he, he snubbed us saying he didn't want me after Doherty mm. and in some ways Mourinho could have said that thinking he gave it to a manager with no honours yeah. after Fergie and it, you know but, he, he, but obviously he relented because he's always wanted the job but I want to go back to your back to your career briefly Gary yeah. and you spoke about you, know, you won a few cups but I want to talk to you about uh, about a couple of games really I want to talk to you about the 79 semi-final we know the final was disappointing yeah. but after the first game, uh, I was, remember being in the first game, I was in the main stand. I went down, actually, didn't have a ticket with my dad, I was only nine. And the people were charging silly money, man. It's equivalent of about £500 for a ticket now. And for a ticket, well, the, 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 ticket, the tickets were actually going for about £100 and they were about £2 to get in. And my dad said, just that, I'm not going to get in here, son. And uh, this guy... It was the main road? Yeah, this guy just came over to my dad and goes, yeah, mate, do you a ticket? My dad just goes, I can't afford it, pal. He goes, I've seen you, he goes, face value. So we get, get my dad had a ticket and I was only there. Walked up to the turnstile. I said, Can I just lift my son over? And he goes, Oh, we can't, mate. We've been leaving, you know, we've been told to go. Yeah. Dad just said, I've just paid a hell of a lot of money for this ticket. And the guy went, Quick, go on then. You know what I mean? <laughs> and we got in. And after five minutes, and I mentioned this to Kenny Daglish actually, he wasn't very he wasn't very uh, polite, actually. I was dead polite to him. And after five minutes, I remember Daglish walked past about five of our players and he scored. And I thought we were just gonna get hammered. Yeah. Yeah. But we didn't realise we were in the Liverpool end. And when Liverpool had scored, we looked round and there was all these fans, United fans hitting people with umbrellas. And we were like that. As we looked round, Joe Jordan's coming back from the halfway line like that. And we missed the goal. And then obviously Hansen, Brian Green off uh, RIP, you know, he, he scored. And then thinking, well, did you think after the final whistle that day that, that was, you'd missed a chance? Because Liverpool were a good team in that day, weren't they? Oh, they were, they were the top team. They were European champions. We did sort of, we went, actually went back to Old Trafford and. Um, I sat with Sammy Mack and a few of the lads because uh, I, you know, I was just a young kid and I didn't. I thought at the end of the season they might go and buy a goalkeeper and I was, you know, I was done. So uh, you know, as, as a young kid, you think you're not, not going to get another opportunity. Um, and I was really done because it, Hanson, what had happened was a cross had come in and I'd, I'd had to 
dive across and get a hand on it. Um, and it had gone to Hansen. It could have gone anywhere. And it went straight to Alan Hansen. And so I felt like, could I have done more with the ball? And, and the lads all said, no. I mean, you had to come for it, and you're not, you've got no idea where it's going to go. Um, and so we went to um, Goodison Park for the, the replay. And I just thought, man, now we're up against European champions again. And if we lose this one, there's my perhaps my, my one and only chance ever to get to Wembley. Because in those days, it, was, it wasn't every year teams got to Wembley, wasn't no, it? I mean, no, no. And it was a huge thing. I mean, the FA Cup back in those days was almost bigger than the league. Um, I remember that game and, and I thought, can I grab another one? Yeah, one, two. Yeah. We can just put this in the room because it's yeah, yeah, we can sort that out. Yeah. Um, it's on the podcast, I'm buying him a drink. Get your back in a bishop sometime. Um, and I remember playing that game and, and when, when Jimmy Greenoff scored, I went, this is awesome. But it was about 10 minutes ago. Yeah, 10 minutes ago. You kicked and it out. You kicked it, you kicked it, you kicked it out of your hands. Yeah. Went to Mickey, did it? I'm sure it might have got ahead of it, it went across to Mickey yeah. quite soon. It was literally, you, you started to move, I'm pretty sure. You kicked it and it went to the left on the bullet and then Jim, Mickey, Mickey, Mickey whipped it, it across and it bounced, bounced once and then and Jimmy, then. Jimmy was different yeah. class. He read oh. the bounce perfectly, he stuck it in the corner. And then I thought, okay, 10 minutes, we have just got to hang on. And they started loading the balls in and uh, flying in at us and elbows and the whole lot. You know how it was in those days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Up and unders and everybody smacked the keeper. Um, and I just thought, I just really, really want to make sure this doesn't go in because I can't go back to Old Trafford a second time, having given away a lead. And when the final whistle went, there was just, it was more relief. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's when it's difficult as a, as a keeper, is that you don't want to be the one that costs everybody else. And, and certainly... They're highlighted, highlighted even more than ever nowadays, aren't they? Yeah, but I mean, in 79, I saw Sammy Mac about six months ago and I was over. And we had a quick giggle about 79. I said, are you still, you're still upset with me? <laughs> Uh, because that's one of the greatest goals he ever scored in that 79 Cup final, yeah. to bring us level at 2-2. Yeah, yeah. And then to see it go down the other end and lose 3-2. And that's the hard part of being a keeper is, is when, when it goes wrong, often you live with the shattered dreams of the rest of the team. Um, at least you got, at least, to be fair, you, you got a chance to, you, you got two Cup final with, with oh, yeah, the other thing, yeah. yeah. But that was, I mean, I must, you know, disappointing because, I mean, everyone knows really, you don't know what's going to happen, like, you don't know whether, like, if the if the team in 58 would have won the European Cup, you don't know what would have happened, yeah. and you don't know, but it was fair to say the momentum was with us in that, if we're going to extra yeah. time oh, that yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, I, I, can't, I can't ever watch the game, because it's not a classic final, it was a classic last 10 minutes, really. It was. And I want, not because of anything else, but I want to cry when after Sammy's goal. Right. I want to cry, because I want yeah. it to just be over, you know what I mean? You know, to this day, when, when, when people come and talk to me about about football in my career. That's the one moment they talk about more than any other. So, some will say the same of 83, and, and that was also a turning moment. Yeah. And, and like everybody thought, oh, hell, we're about to lose the match in the dying moments against Brighton of all well, teams. I wonder, what, I wonder what Gordon Smith gets asked about. Yeah, yeah, well, he gets asked, <laughs> yeah. But the one that where people say to me, you will not believe what happened with 79, because when we equalized, the number of people who were still jumping up and down when, when their winner went in is phenomenal. I mean, I, I would say, I'm just guessing, but 15, 20% of all the people around the world who watched that cup final, United fans were still celebrating <laughs> and couldn't believe. I mean, I've heard people run out into the garden when they came back in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three, three, two is the score. So um, it, it, it really impacted on a lot of people. And even, even United fans will look back and say, yeah, we lost, but what a memory. What, what, a, what a moment. To me, I mean, to me, like the green of goal there in 79. I'm not trying to get too carried away, but it, it's up there. Okay, it's not it's not as not a soul show in ninety nine, but it is up there with like other cup final wins, you know. Ah. The celebration, the I told Jimmy Green, I'm saying I didn't interview Jimmy Green for a fanzine and I told him uh, that you know if you go into YouTube, we didn't know what YouTube is, Jimmy, bless you, Mark. <laughs> I send him his links to go to, I said, if you go into YouTube, if you just put yeah. in yeah. That, that green off goal that's what you have to type in uh, and it comes up does it? you don't even have to put 79 you, know, you just put the, that green yeah. off goal and it comes up and it's, it's all celebration he's, he's, kiss, he's yeah. kissing I think he kissed Lou didn't he and all that yeah. Or it was, yeah, yeah, he yeah. was just like and all that yeah. and, you know it was Brilliant. just uh, it's an iconic Brilliant. moment really like what it was, it was. I mean an 84, 84 Cup Winners Cup I mean oh. you know we, we, we beat Mighty Barcelona which one of my to, to mi- at Old Trafford, yeah. it's probably the, great, the greatest atmosphere I've ever experienced. But but the TV clips don't do it justice because it wasn't a lot, it wasn't on live. It was just on the highlights, yeah. so you don't get the full yeah. the full yeah. feel of it. You just sort of get clips, and so, sometimes it goes straight up and then it shows you just like that a bit. 
and it's, there's nothing happening. But yeah. if you were there that night, yeah. there was there was more than fifty eight thousand there for a start because yeah. people were just passing tickets back for the yeah. end and all that. Well, the, the thing was, it, it, people, you know, youngsters have got no idea what that night was like because they think, oh, well, we've had Barcelona come here before in Real Madrid. No, <clears throat> this was one of our rare opportunities in Europe. Um, and, the, and we'd drawn some really crappy teams in previous European ties, you know, Polish teams and yeah. Czech teams. And, yeah. and suddenly we got one of the giants of, of Europe and Maradona was playing. Bon, it was Boniek. Uh, no. So you're thinking of... I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the Juventus yeah, the semi-final. Juventus, yeah. I thought, so yeah, I'm, going, I'm, I'm skipping on. Yeah, sorry. And they had Bern Schuster. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and suddenly we had real European football back at Old Trafford. And and to and being 2-0 down from the first leg, yeah. to win it 3-0 uh, was just a, a brilliant performance. And then the semi... We, we really uh, had it on the ropes, so didn't we? You know, like yeah. when we got the second and third goal away, you, the crowd was sort yeah. of making it on, and they, 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 were, they panicked really bad, didn't they? They, 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 they were overawed, really. Top team, but were overawed by they us. Were, they were, and there was, they didn't like the physical side of it. And um, I think Frank got stuck in on the keeper a few times, and, they, and the tackles were flying in, and they they weren't that keen. But yeah, they, they panicked. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, but it was a semi final where we got taught a footballing lesson. Thank you. It just showed how far off the pace we were because at home we drew 1 1 with Juventus. Carlo Rossi got the goal. Yeah. <clears throat> Which at the time he was like, um, he was like the, well, no, I wouldn't say Messi, but I mean, he'd, he'd won the World Cup nearly single handedly for Italy. I always so. remember uh, the warm ups because they, they didn't, remember, they didn't travel the Continental fans at all, but the Juventus had about 200 fans. Yeah. Barcelona had about 100 fans that time, you know, because. It was English clubs who sort of yeah. travel more. I always remember everyone, everyone serenading the Stratford End serenading Palio Rossi with Palio Rossi, and he was waving. Yeah. I don't think he realised the translation. <laughs> it was very funny. Yeah. Uh, but we, we got a we got a draw at home, and then we went to their place and played. And that for me was my best match I ever played for United. Yeah, over, uh, we we got hammered. And we were still in with a shout. We had we had we had uh, Brian Robson missing. We had about four of our first team players yeah, missing. Yeah. Against and they had Boniek, Platini, Rossi. They had a six of the Italy World Cup winning team, and they played us off the park. But we we had, we hang in there until the very last minute, and then they I scored. Think you the played one. against Boniek for two different teams, didn't didn't he? I'm sure you played for Wits, you lots. 1980. I'm did sure. He? I'm sure he did. I'm, I'm just saying. I'll check it out. <laughs> I'd be embarrassed if it's not because I'm on podcast, but I'm, I know, I know, I'm pretty sure right, yeah. he was during the solidarity thing. I just remember it. Mm, mm. I'm pretty sure he played in that. I think we drew, I think we drew that nil nil at home, or it was, it was we, I think we might have gone out on the way goes, but we have drew one yeah. all at home or nil nil at one of them. Yeah. And uh, that was it. that's the closest we came, semi final in Europe. Almost there again, eh? It was a very frustrating time. I'm, I'm just grateful we beat Everton in '85 because that was one of those days where we did did come together. And Norman's goal was just superb. But down to ten men, Kevin off. I've admitted this to Norman German. now, but yeah. I, know, I see Norman quite a bit. It's really, 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 but at the time, don't you remember about ten minutes before the end of normal time? Norman had a similar sort of like runner towards Southall, but he fluffed it. He fluffed it a bit. I think, he, I think Southall just saved him at the edge of the box. So when he when he got the ball, I was I was screaming. I was in the side where the goal was good, but I was going in that little white tunnel in the corner, mm. and I was going, pass it to Strachan, pass it to Strachan. <laughs> and then he then he put the foot over and kicked it in. I went, no, man, I love you. <laughs> and I'm admitting it now, you know. Yeah. It was just a, now you went down, you know, the whole team was saying to him, okay, take it into the corner, because our logic then with ten men against the champions was, let's just see out, you know, see it out for a draw and get a replay. Um, when he stuck it in the, in the back of the net again you're thinking as a goalkeeper you're thinking alright here we go because we had no Kevin with Frank Stapleton playing at half time yeah. uh, centre half rather I'm talking to him all the time Frank stand here Frank go there Frank do. I'm thinking whatever happens now we've got to give six minutes where we just don't screw up Yeah. and I've got to make sure that Frank's in the right place and, and everybody's covering I think who was the other centre half oh, Paul McGrath was magnificent yeah. that day magnificent um, and, uh, and again you you shouldn't think these things as a goalkeeper, but you do sometimes. You think we, ne- we, we might not, if we replay this, we're going to struggle against the champions. So yeah. this is our chance, and we've got to make sure. And they were possibly, some, some could argue they were a bit tired after the midweek because they played in the Cup Winners' Cup, didn't they? Mm. I, I remember after the game in the coach park at Wembley, and you know, we used to keep the fans, it was such a nightmare. There was like a little exit for one coach, and there was uh-huh. hundreds of coaches. Mm. 
and we're waiting about two hours. We're all, you know, fifty, all drinking our cans of skull and you know, what to do <laughs> and all that. And by pure luck, the coaches were mixed. And next thing, the Everton team coach was right alongside oh. ours, and we were all on the window. Like, ah. And I always remember how we kind of, you know, sadly died not long too long ago. Mm. And he looked, they all looked really tired. And the whole Everton coach, how we kind of doing like that, clapping. Up, apart from Graham Sharp, and Graham Sharp went. <laughs> and it, it made a gesture to us <laughs> yeah, with the number five on one hand and, yeah. and uh, I think it was the number one he was referring to on yeah. the other hand yeah. and it, but that made the coach laugh more our coach yeah. we, did, we nearly like went over we were going <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know and that was just uh, and then the homecomings was something different I mean even like you know when we lost the cup in 79 we went to Manchester the that homecomings was it's unbelievable isn't it that was one of the best I've ever seen 79 I didn't expect that because we got off uh, um, the train we put the train back yeah so it was from the train station 79, I can't remember exactly where. Um, and I expected a handful of people to turn out. They said over 250,000 people turned out. It was phenomenal. After having lost it. Yeah, you know? yeah. The same in 76 when uh, the famous, when Tommy Duckett famously said, well, we're back next year, which is quite a bold statement because mm. not many teams got to mm. final two years running, did they, for a long time, you know? Yeah. And we did, obviously. But uh, who was your... It, it, it was just sort of like it was just sort of like closest to it in in the teams at United, and it was it was just sort of like would you say was the real it was the real leaders. Some might be obvious, but it was the real you know, or maybe unsung heroes that you played with. Gee, it's quite a lot of, a lot of questions all at once. Um, friends, I mean, I guys like Ray Wilkins, Frank Stapleton, I enjoyed their company. Um, would room with them most of the time. Room with Arnie Muren a bit. And often roomed on my own. I mean, goalkeepers tend to get put on their own sometimes. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, I kept to myself. I was the only single guy in the team, which also caused a bit of a, you know, of difficulty. Um, Tommy Kavanagh, I'm never a big fan of Tommy Kavanagh as the assistant coach. I, I didn't think he added much to, to Dave Sexton's, you know, uh, team talks or anything. But Tommy Kev said to me when I got in the first team, he said, I'm going to give you one bit of advice. He said, you must take this advice. And I was waiting for something really deep and meaningful. He said, get yourself married. And I went, what? Come again. He said, get married. I said, what's it got to do with football? <laughs> he said, you want someone to look after you and take the pressure off and cook for you and be at home for you. I said, do me a favor. I'm a single guy. I'll get married when I want to get married. Yeah. Gee. It, it, maybe his intentions were good, but, it, but, it was, yeah. but maybe he was like, yeah. Yeah. And then I realized, as the years went on, I realized what it is, is all the other footballers were married. And they socialised together, and, and when times were tough, they would, you know, the wives would help out in terms of giving them moral support. And if I had a bad game, I went home on my own and sat in with my own thoughts, and and, so, and there was no socialising or a lot less socialising with the players because the wives would always arrange dinners, yeah, and I was yeah. left out of it. Um, Did you ever go to the Paddy's pub in Altrincham? No, I wasn't a big drinker. I mean, I went there after the, you know, after the odd game, but I was not a big drinker, which also was a difficult thing because I'm. I was more you were ahead of it, ahead of your time in some ways, in yeah. many many ways. I trained a lot more. I did the sort of two training sessions a day. I'd stay in the afternoon and train with the kids, which is now more common. Um, and educational wise, it was very different. So yeah, it was a strange. Uh, it was a tough world to come into at 20. Um, I mean, if you think about it, the, the two centre halves in front of me were the two centre halves for Scotland in the '78 World Cup. Yeah. Martin Buck and Gordon McQueen. Yeah. Um, and Joe Jordan up front. Now these are. Players who are in, way in their twenties, late twenties, senior World Cup players. Did you, did you ever like, or sort of like, speak to Stevie Coppel? Because you both come from an educated background with d d degrees. Mm. I mean, and obviously, you know, that you, you know, obviously, you know, you, 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 you tend to sort of like, you know, remember, you know, Chucky used to, Ryan McClare used to sort of like, you know, he was. You know, he, he tends to sort of like, you know, he, he got a lot of people, he likes to go out for a drink, but he, he probably likes to chat certain things with certain people, yeah, you know, yeah, on his yeah. wavelength, whatever. Yeah, now Stevie, actually Stevie was another good friend, I really had a lot of time for Stevie, great guy. Have you ever seen him nowadays? No, I haven't seen him for years. When he was manager of Reading, I met him in London just to sort of uh, catch up with where he's up to. That was about 10 years ago, so the last I saw him. Um, but his was a different situation because he was, he was already an England player. Yeah. And he was a forward, so there's less pressure on you as a forward. I mean, as long as he put crosses in and scored the odd goal. He's a bit unsung, God, as well, because I mean, he, he, yeah. he held, still holds a record for the longest consecutive games yeah. without missing a game, you know, and there's no rest yeah, in him until he, he got injured. Very, and... very good player, very fit player. But, you know, this, this is why I admire David De Gea so much, is, is when I went in, 
all these senior pros, and Scottish senior pros, they were really hard assed and um, they give you a real stick as a, as a keeper, a real stick, all the time. But they didn't, it's just the way they did it, it's just, yeah. you know, but for me I took it personally, I thought, gee, why are they always on it me, and why is it always me that's the fault? And it wasn't just what they would say to any keeper all the time, you know, even if you played well. How, how was like the, the keepers around you in United? I mean, like, was it was Alex Stepney like you know was he was he, was he understandable for you going through and was like when you had like people like Stephen Pears and others around there you know you know because was it healthy competition or was it just like yeah. no it was it was always good I mean again I was never close to any of them um, Alex Alex was really thirty five so he knew his yeah. days were numbered but he probably took it hard losing his place. But he was always supportive. Alex was always great. Paddy Roach was around. Um, Paddy, um, Paddy stayed for a little while, then moved on. Jeff Whelan's arrived. Stephen oh, Pears. Jeff. Jeff ended up playing at Altrincham as well, you know. Did he? Yeah, yeah. Not, not only about. You're looking at maybe about ninety or early nineties. He was at Altrincham. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Stephen Pears, Gary Walsh. I mean, I had a lot, had a lot of. Um, Deputies during those years. I mean, I was there for you know, nine years as the number was one. Chris keeper. Turner. Chris Turner was another one. Yeah, Chris yeah. Turner. Towards the end, when I got injured, he came in. Um, but, uh, they, they, you're rivals with them, so you're never best buddies. You're never ever yeah. going to be. I was more buddies with Chris Woods because we we roomed from England under 21 all the way through yeah. to the World Cup in '86. We roomed together. Well, he, he got a bit of a chance, really. You could say like you really, didn't he? With with with, with, the, with the, certainly in the in the. Uh, he played. He played the fa- deep in your Forest. Chris Woods. Yeah, uh, I think it was at for- Norwich Forest and Rangers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, he was lucky in England because I was number two to Shilton for ten years and hardly got a break. Fast drink, okay. as usual. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he was alcohol. Yeah. Have a cheeky belly. Thank you. Would you like anything else at the minute? I'm good. No, I'm we're good fine, friends. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was number two to Shilton for, for nine years, um, and as soon as I got injured, Shilton packed in, what, a few years later, after 1990 World Cup, and Woodsy racked up 50 caps. Yeah. So, you know... Was... Well, I mean, I suppose in a way, a bit like Alex, was Alex Stepney, when he was goalkeeper for United, he was seen as one of the top keepers in the country, but he obviously had uh, Banks, Shilton around, or Shilton was emerging, wasn't he? Yeah, Banks, that's... and he had Peter Benetti, I think he'd... You had a handful of caps. How many caps did you get? A couple of caps? Did you? I got a couple, a couple of full, full caps. Yeah. Yeah. A whole bunch of under 21 caps. Yeah. So. But it ran, runs in your blood, though, doesn't it? I mean, your dad, obviously, you know, you inherited your football genes from your father. Yeah, yeah, he was a keeper at Ipswich when they won the league in 61, so. Um, and he was a good coach for me. He really gave me the basics. I, if it wasn't for him, I, I would have struggled because our basics were, were really good. I mean, throughout my career, very rarely dropped things or, you know... Was he the biggest influence on you? Oh, yeah, yeah. by far. Um, unfortunately, when, when I came here, he couldn't come with, so I was left on my own. Uh, it's, a, it's a different world then as well to what it is now. I mean, the players, A, the players earn a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you get looked after. You get yeah, they probably need to sometimes buy your houses for your family. I know certain United players where the parents have been, like, been brought over as, as kids. Yeah. Obviously, been a good, good prospect, and the family's bought a house or put in a house for so many years. Yeah. You know, looks after. So they, you know, well, they find them jobs within the club if they need to earn yeah. a little bit of money. Or even at least flown over. I mean, in those days, um, they, they they paid me nothing when they signed me. Virtually, um, I got I got one phone call a month home. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Remember, there was no connection in those days. You didn't. Yeah, you yeah. Know, you had to write a letter. It took two two weeks to get there. So I got one phone call a month, and uh, I wasn't on a decent wage until I'd been in the first team about four or five years. Did you, did you get more like, was it, was your bonuses, was they the better things in terms of cup runs and all that? Oh yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Mind you, in 79, the tax was so high, I couldn't touch any of it, because it was just getting taxed at 80% or something, so I left it all in a pension. Right. <laughs> which is a good thing, because um, it now gives me a little bit every month yeah. extra. Um, but yeah, the, the world was a different world then, and... and um, you were basically told as a young kid, because I went, I went to complain about something, and they just said, look, don't even think of complaining. You know, if you don't like it, go back to South Africa, we've got a whole bunch of other players who will take your place. Really? Um, and that's how it was, it was tough. It was, uh, you know, get on with it and figure it out. And Whereas today, you, you get psychologists talk to you, you get people help you settle in, you, and then you have enough money to do whatever you want. If you want to fly your parents over, and, um, 
So, yeah, it was... It was have you good. always had family in Ipswich, even though you went to South Africa, have you had always family? I mean, because I want to talk about that famous game at Ipswich when we got trounced oh. 6 nil, and you saved two penalties, in theory, three penalties, because yeah. one got retook. I mean, did you, ever, did you get any stick for that at the time? For maybe? Well, both my folks are from London. Right. My dad started at Palace, and it was Sir Alf Ramsey who took him to Ipswich, so I didn't really have family. I had uh, friends of my parents who lived there. And, uh, the, and, the, and the chairman of Ipswich at the time was Cobbled, Patrick Cobbled, and Bobby Robson was the manager. And the year before, I'd actually been on trial there. Right. And I went because my dad asked, you know, because I was already sort of showing some signs that I had some talent. And he sent me to Ipswich and said, go and see what it's like. And it snowed for nine weeks. I don't really? if you remember, it was seven, the winter of 77. Yeah, yeah, that's what I remember. That's yeah. what I remember yeah, it yeah. was a shocker of a winter. I never got to play. So um, when I made my debut, it was against Ipswich, which was amazing enough, again, yeah. where I was born and where my dad played. And Bobby Robson afterwards said, I uh, wish I'd have got to see you last year. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so that was nice. So, so by the time I got to play at Portman Road, I was like, okay, I'm going to show Bobby Robson and, and show the, the chairman of Ipswich. And we want to put on a good game today. And of course, we got absolutely... Was that your first game there? Yeah, we got oh, hammered I didn't, six. I didn't realize that was your first game there. Yeah, we got hammered six. And even the, even the magazine before, we welcome the son of former Ipswich goalkeeper Roy Bailey welcome Gary Bailey and it's going to be a big day for him 6-0 <laughs> but, 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 as well as you could say 6-0 you, know, you had a good game yeah I did I was yeah. the only one who got away with any any pride from that so you played with some inspirational players I mean to people my age again uh, Jimmy Green of was, was one of my first idols but Brian Robson I mean it's often been compared to Brian Robson or Roy Keane obviously you didn't play with Roy Keane but I mean you know, would, you be, would you be biased if you see Robson as the ultimate, like grabbing you, grab the team by the neck, hero, sort of like leader? Very similar, but I, I would I would say Robbo was the better of the two because he had a lot of skill as well. Robbo, I'm not saying Aquino didn't. I mean he did as well, but but Robbo literally had had everything: um, two feet, good in the air, great engine to get up and down, and, and a good touch player, really really good touch player. I thought Kino was a little bit more muscle, a little bit more aggro, and less of the touch. But I mean, you're, you're talking about two two wonderful players either way. But um, for me, Robo was special. And again, if he'd have been less injured, both for England and for United, would have got more out of him. Um, would would the medical staff today have been able to manage Robo better? Possibly. Who knows? But it was a, it was a pity we lost him for big chunks of the season. You made the comparison between the Villa team. Uh, and like you say, maybe the Leicester team having a looking United you know, in those days it's fair to say that when Robbo did get injured because it wasn't a squad game mm. we really literally fans used to just gasp and think that's the season over and not but it's wrong to say about my team we had a talented team mm. but Robson was such a big part of it you didn't really have in depth of squads did you like you do nowadays yeah no we didn't and also we had a we had a very light squad in terms of physical Especially in the mid '80s, you know, once Joe Jordan, Gordon McQueen, those players had moved on, um, Gordon Strachan, Jesper Olsen, they were touch players. So Alan Bissell, you know, Norman Whiteside was one strong player, very brave. So was Mark Hughes when he got in, but then we sold him fairly quickly. So Robert was the the player you almost you needed him because we had nobody else. Ray Wilkins was a lovely touch player, but again, no aggro, no, it wasn't hard in any way. Another was Sammy Mack, another was Mickey Thomas. So when you took Robert out of it, you took you took the fort, the sort of physical presence, the guts out of the team. Um, we had Remy Moses next to Robert for a while, which was potentially a great combination. Then Remy got injured. So if you if you'd have kept Remy and Brian fit the whole time, we'd have won the league. Because now these days we understand defensive midfielders. We know that you can't yeah. just keep attacking. But in those days we, we lost Remy through injury. We lost Robert often. And then we had a, a very light team, and um, and that's why Everton went on to win the league. Is that they had Peter Reid in midfield and Bracewell, and they they just ran you down, which you had to do back in the day. Liverpool were the, the one enigma that they were the one team that, well, mind you, they had Sunes, but they could play their way out of trouble. Mm. There was just something I don't I don't know how they did it. They did it year after year. They played European football in England. The rest of us played English football. Yeah. Yeah, because um, they could they could switch from playing away at Stoke on a Saturday to play you know Real Madrid on a Wednesday. I mean they wouldn't change their style and they would still go out and beat Real Madrid, and they could beat Stoke by playing football. 
for some reason they could do it, but nobody else could. So with, without Robbo and, and another defensive midfielder, we were always vulnerable in midfield. And so, it, when, as you said, when we lost him, we lost the guts of the team. Thank you, Gary. Well, nearly, I just what I'd say about Sir Alex. I mean, obviously, your career, I would account, you know, you, you didn't stay for a year. Sir Alex was there, but he was, was you know, I believe you, you've got a good relationship with uh, Sir Alex. He was very uh, complimentary about you. He's been very complimentary about you. And did he did he do a forward in your book even? Or something? He did. He did a forward in my book. Oh, he's just been, uh, you know, besides the fact that I think he's the greatest manager of all time, he's always been incredibly decent and, um, and, and amazing. He doesn't have to spend time with ex-players, or if he does, he can just go, "Hi, how are you doing?" I mean, it's only with him for. I think I played five games for him. I think at the end of it, uh, Chris Turner got injured. He said to me, Gary, either you're, you're fit or you're not. Either you're going to play or you're not. And I played five games, and after the fifth game, I couldn't walk properly. And, and he was always great. But years later, he saw me in Johannesburg at the airport, and he was flying first class, because I think he's got family in South Africa. He was flying first yeah. class back. I was flying economy class. And he said, he said, OK, well, enjoy the trip. And then when we got to Heathrow, him and his wife were there, and um, he saw me there, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm catching the tube into London. He said, you want to lift? I said, I don't want to impose his that. Come with me. And so we jumped in his limo and, and you know, he dropped me off in, in London. And he didn't have to do that. He really didn't. Um, this was his time to maybe get on the phone and start you know, buying and selling players and doing yeah. stuff. And he actually had one or two phone calls and, you know, he just, just sort of he just said, look, I'll talk to you guys later because I'm with somebody in the car. Um, that is, really, that, that is a sign that, of a true, Yeah, true. it is. It's a true, he's a great man as well as a great manager, and I think that's why he was a great manager. Is there's very few players who criticise him. They'll say he was hard. They'll say that, that he, he kicked them out of the club too early, but very few have ever said that he didn't care for them. I think he's a real people person, one who, in the moment he says to you, the club no longer needs you, he feels the pain that you feel. He's been there, he knows it. Um, I, I've often referred to him as one of the most emotionally intelligent people I've ever met. Well, if, if, if the rumour goes right, and it's, I've spoken to him a few times, but I've not asked him this, I don't know why I'm not asking this, but when, when it like Cantona was going to leave for the Sellers Park in the summer mm, of 95, yeah, yeah. there's rumours that Fergie was on the back of a motorbike round Paris trying to locate Eric at one stage, you know what I mean, on, on, as, a, as a passenger. Yeah, seriously? Yeah, apparently, yeah, and, and I, think, I think it was that dedication that when Eric's seen that this manager has come all this way, you know, not all this way, Paris is not a fan either, but you know what I mean, you've gone to that trouble, yeah. the guy that could be, should be chauffeured around even then, and he's coming around and he's on the back of someone pointing out the directions yeah. and all that. The same as Van Nistelrooy, yeah? Yeah. He kept in touch with Van Nistelrooy. That, that's the thing about him is that under all this pressure, somehow pressure didn't get to him the same way, um, because under all the pressure he could still act as a decent human being. And I think all of us struggle with that. You put anybody under enough pressure, yeah. we all act like idiots, we all do stupid things, we all panic. Um, he never did. He never did. He can make rash decisions, even in the most difficult circumstances. Um, an, an exceptional manager in every sense of the word. Well, he's very brave as well, because obviously, sometimes you've got to make decisions that aren't popular with the rest of your team and what aren't popular yeah. with the fans. And it's been well documented, and Norman speaks so well of him, but you know, he felt he needed to like break up what he thought was yeah. the bad side of United with rock, you know, with the what he thought the drinking culture. club, mm. and he broke that up. And fans didn't like it at the time. I didn't like it at the time. But you know, he, he saw. You look at the bigger picture. I don't like to compare someone like Guardiola to Ferguson, but you know, you can't really disagree with, with something like seeing someone like Torre, maybe, as, and, and you know, as maybe like a problem, you know, putting someone in his place, whether it's his agent or not. And the way Guardiola said he's putting his marker down now and then he, he, you know he got rid of Joe Hart because he thought it wasn't yeah, what he wanted yeah. you know? and sometimes you've got to make those decisions haven't you yeah there's a, the, the big the, the, the big difference for me is that Pep and Jose Mourinho have almost all the time been given great squads yeah Fergie built his squad um, he didn't just build one team did he each time he looked like he might be any people exactly. might have been doubting him you get another team out of them wouldn't they and one of those teams he built through players that he through the academy system and they turn out to be three or four of the greatest players in the history of football. How, to, to, to have done any one of those things, to have built one team is awesome, to build four or five teams is genius and to build one of those teams from players that you personally help scout or bring into the club or nurture, uh, it's, just, it's just one incredible achievement after the other and that's why for me he's, 
he's still a greater manager than anybody else in the game. But but having said that, Mourinho's not far behind him, and I hope, I really hope, as we conclude the podcast, that Mourinho goes on to be even better than Fergie, because it means we've got years of success ahead. Thank you, Gary. That's great. Could you tell us, family, what, what is in the TV work, what you're doing in America now? Similar to what I was doing in South Africa, I present um, football on a, a channel called BN, B-E-I-N. It's a smaller channel, but it has um, Spanish football, Italian and French. Um, and Are you the anchor man, like? I, I mix up. I can anchor or I can be a guest, so they move me around depending on, on who's available. <laughs> um, but it's great because it, it's near where I live in Miami. Uh, it means I get to live up by the beach, which has always been my dream. And I've gone from I've gone from Salford Key to, the, <laughs> to Miami Beach, so <laughs> going up in the world. <laughs> um, whereas all the other broadcasters up in New York, and it's a bit miserable and cold up there most of the year. Um, so I get to live by the beach in Miami. And did you just get approached after seeing South Africa work? You know what? I didn't. I actually left without a job. I left South Africa without a job because my kids wanted to study um, in the US. And, I didn't, and they probably wouldn't come back to South Africa. So I didn't want to be left on my own without them. And Because um, we have difficulty with the education system there, getting into universities. It's a, on a quota system. So for the white kids, it's difficult for them. So a lot of white kids study abroad. Um, and so I just thought, you know what, why don't I go and live in America with them? And so I applied for a green card and they gave it to me. They thought I could help them out with soccer or something along those lines. So they gave us a green card. And um, we all moved. I had no job. And I only got there for like three, four months into it. I'm going, holy crap, I don't have a job. <laughs> I've got no money coming in. I've got four teenagers at university and all the money going out. And I was beginning to panic. And, um, and then this job opportunity came up. And you know, it started off slowly and then it built up. And now I'm a regular there under contract and everything. And life in the US is just, it's my dream life. It's what I, you know, really it's what, what I grew up, grew up in the sunshine and beaches. And that's how I live. Um, so yeah, but occasionally the lads come over. Kevin Moran and his wife came over last year. And they do the reverse. They live in Manchester, come visit Miami. I prefer to live in Miami, come visit Manchester. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, thanks, Gary. That's brilliant, and uh, I hope, uh, I'm sure, lots of people are going to enjoy this honest interview. And uh, yeah, with as I, as I put on Twitter, uh, one of my boyhood heroes. It's oh, great well, now, and, uh, and I promise you, I'll buy you a pint. Just one pint now on right. Saturday. And, and, and also, good luck to you with this. I hope, I hope it continues. And you've got, you got access to the players, and, and it's a nice, as you say, a nice, honest look behind the scenes. So keep it going. Thanks very much, Gary. Happy. Cheers, mate.